I'm Angela Heron. I'm the editor for Special Projects and Research at HBR. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for this event as part of Integrated Marketing Week. I also want to thank SAS for making this possible. We want this to uh, be a discussion that's very interactive in the room, and we're also going to be having a conversation on Twitter. And so if you want to join in at any time on that, issue your remarks. Um, but isn't it two tweets minimum per person for <laughs> each glass of wine or something like that? That's right, exactly. <laughs> so find us at HBR Exchange and, or at Harvard Biz. You, I know some of you are uh, Twitter followers with us, but use the hashtag HBR in person. So I'm very excited about tonight because this week marks the publication of Tom Davenport's 16th book. This book uh, that he's published is with us. It is uh, a book, the title is Keeping Up With Quants, uh, Your Guide to Understanding and Using Analytics. It's, like I said, yesterday was the actual official publication date. It's getting very good reviews and I would like to share with you one rave review and of course HBR, did, we did publish it which says, you know, this is a terrific book for those who aspire to be data-savvy consumers or managers. I would recommend this book to anyone who is using data, big or small, to make decisions. Actually, well, that pretty much encompasses anyone. Whether you're picking stocks or making a marketing decision or deciding if you should get a pet, you will learn something from Davenport. Only 50 bucks that review cost me. It's amazing. <laughs> and you'll actually get a copy of this book tonight for being in the room. But seriously, I think that all of us at HBR feel like that we have learned a lot about how analytics and big data can really be a competitive differentiator. Um, f we've learned all of this from Tom over the years. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but in 2006, he originally published an article with HBR that was called Competing on Analytics. Um, it became a big hit. It, it still is today. The editors at HBR recognize it as one of the most important management ideas of the past decade. And it remains one of the 10, 10 must-read articles in HBR um, in, in the magazine's 90th, 90 year history. So he followed that article up with two books, um, Competing on Analytics and then Working with Analytics. Uh, he now has the new book, Keeping Up with Quants. And if I can give you a, beef, a brief preview, he actually does have a new book coming out about big data. Uh, I believe the title is set now, yes? Can I? I think so. Okay. Which is Big Data at Work, Dispelling the Myths, Uncovering the Opportunities. So we're very excited to have him with us tonight. When Tom is not writing and researching, he is the President's Distinguished Professor of Management and Information Technology at Babson. He's also been a visiting professor at Harvard Business School this year. He, as I mentioned, he has written uh, 15 books before this, including first in the areas of, of uh, process uh, engineering, uh, re-engineering, knowledge management, and business use of enterprise systems. Um, we're very pleased with ha to have him with us tonight uh, to talk about some of his insights. We're going to have him talk with us a little bit. I'm going to do a brief interview, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So, Tom, thanks so much. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks to SAS for hosting this event. SAS has sponsored a lot of my research in the past, and a fair amount of it went into that book and certainly the other books on analytics, so uh, uh, nice to, to be here on their behalf. Um, so I thought I'd say a few words about analytics in marketing and marketing of analytics. Um, kind of a um, recursive little thing there. Um, analytics in marketing, uh, well, it's, I think, becoming second nature to some organizations. Um, there are lots and lots of things one can do with, with um, analytics in marketing. And uh, I don't know. A couple of years ago, I was thinking about this issue. In fact, um, Adele Sweetwood is here from SAS, and I, I was talking to Adele, and I said, Adele, you know, what do you think I should do next? Now, granted, she is uh, head of marketing for SAS in the in the U.S., but she said, I think analytics and marketing, you know, that's the that's the real um, area where things are happening, and. I thought about it and I thought, yeah, but there's so many different things you can do. I mean, you can talk about analytics and pricing, you can talk about analytics and promotions. Uh, um, I mean, all of the five Ps I think you could probably address and then lots of other areas as well, the whole, um, everything about um, web analytics and uh, testing and uh, everything related to internet and omnichannel. It's just kind of overwhelming. 
And so I thought, well, okay, I need to sort of pick something a little more narrow. So I um, decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this whole issue of offers and how organizations make effective next best offers. And, you know, that's kind of constrained and, you know, relatively narrow. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, if I can do something on that, I will um, move on to something else. And so I started researching this issue of, of next best offers. Some people call it next best actions. And how do you do that effectively? And I don't know, it didn't turn out to be quite as simple as I had hoped. Um, because if you think about it, to do offers well, um, and this did result in a Harvard Business Review article, so it's legitimate to talk about on this very stage. Um, <laughs> Uh, to do offers well, you first have to kind of have some general sense of what's your strategy, what products are you interested in, in um, offering, and is it mostly products or services or um, actions that don't necessarily involve money for the, your company, but at least deepen the relationship and so on. So then you have to know your customer. Let's face it, that's hard enough for most organizations these days because your customer may have a different name aco across every different channel that you encounter him or her, and your customer may be in a household, and trying to match up your customer to the household is, is always very difficult, and you know, your customer may be purposely <laughs> avoiding you learning more about them. So you know, that's very difficult in the first place, but um, okay, let's say you master that. Then you have to think about mastering your product uh, portfolio, your product offering. So, I mean, obviously, if you're going to match up your products with your customers, you kind of have to know what are the attributes of products that customers find appealing. So um, I was talking to a variety of companies about this. Um, I found out that manufacturers of products don't really classify the attributes for you. So companies have to do it themselves. Um, and this is true of products and services. I'm going to talk about products first. Um, uh, then I'll say a little bit about um, services, because I had a conversation about it at breakfast this morning. But in products, I was really impressed by Zappos. I don't know how many of you um, buy shoes from Zappos. Um, I don't know if you um, are aware of this, but even if you do a search on Zappos merchandise, mostly shoes. I guess they sell purses and so on, too. Um, uh, a really complex classification system. So uh, you have to choose among what you know, brand you like, what color you like, what size you like, um, style, pattern, et cetera. Um, so I was, I was really curious about pattern. And I thought, what, what does that even mean? So I looked at all the types of patterns. And there are, you know, 40 or so different patterns. Under P alone, I had these memorized, but I forgot them after my first glass of wine tonight, sorry. Um, uh, but uh, the words um, just that start with P, there are, I think, seven. Pebble, Paisley, I don't know. You can, uh, yeah, you can imagine some of the different P words uh, for pattern. But um, just having your employees classify all these shoes, is that Paisley? Is it? pebble grain, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good deal of work. Well, why would you have to do that? Well, because you may have a customer who loves Paisley. In fact, I think you love Paisley, don't you, Angela? Um, and uh, if you want to tell them, look, I have a new Paisley shoe that's just hit the market, you've got to know that it's Paisley. So there's all the product stuff. Then increasingly, you have to know about the purchase context. So, has that person just searched for a Paisley shoe on another site? Um, if it's a brick and mortar store, do they happen to be walking by your store? Um, and you know, we can do that you know, with, under certain conditions with your cell phone now. So a lot of purchase context. Then it's really the easy part, matching up all of these characteristics so you make an effective offer. Most companies don't do the first three things very well, so they don't do the matching. Very well, and then you think, well, how did that work? Um, you know, I, I talked to CVS. In fact, we did a thing together with CVS um, uh, in your building, and you know, any of you members of the Extra Care 
program, also known as the world's longest register tapes uh, program. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they make offers to you. This is a heck of a business for them because all the offers for products are actually paid for by the manufacturers. So um, CVS uh, makes nine, they won't say the exact amount, but nine figures worth of profit, uh, not counting cents. <laughs> nine right. dollar figure, nine uh, dollar level figures of profit from the manufacturers and um, obviously, you know, it increases loyalty and so on. And they think every, I think they said this when they were there, every offer is a test. And if you don't cash in that coupon that you get, they'll think, well, maybe we need to give this person a little bit more or maybe we, the product we offered was not quite right, so let's change it around the next time. And they, you know, millions and millions of offers in a year. Um, so, and so then this, that's the last step, thinking about how can we improve it, and then you get around, by that time, this is taking you several years to have to change your strategy. So this is just for offers alone. It's kind of not surprising that organizations have a really tough time with analytics and marketing, because if you decide, okay, I wanna be really good at offers, that alone is a very difficult thing to address. And then, you know, um, uh, hard enough, but then big data comes along and uh, all these new sources of data that can be used for various purposes in marketing. Um, uh, we're talking about tweets, of course, uh, uh, social media, sentiment analysis, that's one aspect of big data that organizations have to manage. And you know, I think the challenge with that, I've been talking to a number of organizations about it recently, and. For a while, of course, everybody was very excited about it, and I worked with a number of companies who were doing sentiment analysis of uh, social media, or people saying good things about my brand, my product, my company. Um, but um, now I sense a, a little bit of, a, I don't know, maybe it's that famous trough of disillusionment where people are saying, okay, we followed it for a while, it went up, it went down, it went up, but we never did anything. We never actually took any action. So I think that's sort of the next frontier with social media as a particular type of big data. What do we do about it under certain circumstances and kind of what are the decisions and actions that we take under certain circumstances? And by the way, what are those circumstances in order to address the issues we are encountering with social media? Can I ask quickly a question? Was part yes. of the problem simply that when people started out using social media, they saw it as an experiment and they never really had a plan, they didn't know what they wanted out of it? I think that was part of it, and they probably didn't realize that it's not an easy thing to do in the first place. I mean, sentiment analysis is, is difficult, even when humans do it, trying to decide whether people are saying positive or negative things is not all that easy. You know, sarcasm comes into play, for example, um, and um, so having computers do it is even harder. I, I still remember I was at a, an event here in New York, and bunch of CEOs and Brian Moynihan, the um, CEO of Bank of America, was there. And we were talking about social media sentiment analysis and I was talking about the ways that you can get computers to analyze it all and he said, that eh, sounds really complicated. We just have interns do that for us. Um, which, you know, kind of put me in my place. But, I, you know, in some cases that might not be a horrible idea. Anyway, there are lots of other types. People increasingly are saying every interaction with your customer um, is something that we can learn from, and um, it, that might be in an inconvenient format. For example, customer calls in to a um, call center, uh, complains about something or other. I was talking the other day with United Healthcare, I think the largest health insurer in the United States, who said, uh, increasingly, we care about consumers. We used to only care about employers, now we care about consumers. Consumers can leave us much more easily than, than a big employer can, and so we have to start worrying about attrition. And so what are the predictors of attrition? Well, we had a few, but um, customers calling up and saying, I'm really mad at you for how badly you treated me, you didn't pay this claim or whatever, it's a pretty good indication that they might attrite. Um, and so how do you deal with that? It's, it's voice, uh, well, okay, you've turned the voice into text, that's relatively straightforward. Then you have to do um, natural language processing on the text. Uh, anyway, they are finding that it is a very, very powerful uh, variable in predicting attrition 
of customers, although you know, a fair amount of trouble to get to. Um, uh, there are, I, you know, for a lot of organizations, there are some banks here in New York City that are doing a lot of this sort of thing where you want to track um, the, the journey that a customer makes through your omni-channel organization. So maybe this happened to me a little while ago. I go to, the, to my, my bank. I won't say which bank it is because it'll be a little disparaging. I put in my ATM. I have plenty of money in my account, and it sucks up my ATM card, never to be seen again. Um, and so what do you do about it? Well, I went to the branch. That's my first customer interaction. They said, no, you know, you need to call this toll-free number. I call the toll-free number. It's hard to get a person in the first place. You finally get one. They say, well, fine, but you, you really need to report it online as well. Um, so, you know, there's three different channels just for dealing with something that was not my fault. It was their screw-up. And apparently, these multi-channel, omni-channel customer journeys are quite revealing of customers' intent to say, forget it, I can't take working with you anymore, I'm going to go to another organization. And we can start to segment them and so on, but that's a lot of data that's in a lot of different places and has to be integrated. It's quite a challenging piece of work. Um, it certainly constitutes big data in many cases, uh, both in terms of volume and lack of structure. Uh, that's, those are the kinds of things that organizations are wrestling with in, in this regard. So um, it's a pretty difficult, complex thing to do analytics in marketing. Uh, it's just that the alternative is death. So um, you... What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, if your competitors are doing it well, you are not going to succeed as a competitor to, to them. So uh, you will go out of business if you don't pursue analytics and marketing. So it's really hard to do, but you have to do it. Now, the other thing I, I mentioned that I would say a few minutes about, and then uh, say a few words about, and then we can... Um, move to any questions you have, Angela, is this whole idea of marketing for analytics. And there's a fair amount about this in this book because um, we, we talk about in this book the stages of thinking analytically. You know, we're, as Angela said, we're trying to help people um, become more analytical in their, their thought process and their decision-making process. And the last stage is a very critical one that a lot of organizations don't really, and, and people don't really address very much, which is communicating your analytical results. And you know, we have some um, good examples and some bad examples of this. A bad example, for example, uh, would be Gregor Mendel, the famous monk who did some fantastic work, um, you know, spent a lot of time looking at uh, inheritance of genetic um, attributes with peas, you know, spent a lot of time uh, crossing different types of peas and so on. So Gregor Mendel, uh, like any good scientist, publishes his work in a scientific journal. Nobody read it, apparently. You know, this is one of the greatest breakthroughs in human um, knowledge, and nobody read it, at least during his lifetime. The poor man died. He, you know, he had this very touching statement. You know, I trust that at some point I will get the, the um, recognition that I deserve for this work, but not before he died, unfortunately. Um, so you want to avoid Gregor Mendel-like um, situations. You want to put as much energy into communicating your results as you do to creating them in the first place. So um, the, the best um, positive example we have in the book is this guy John Gottman. Maybe some of you are familiar with John Gottman. He is a um, marriage scientist. Some of you look too young to be married, but it also works with um, relationships as well, dating relationships. And um, I still remember Malcolm Gladwell wrote about Dr. Gottman that he was a thin slicer. He said, uh, Dr. Gottman can look at you interacting with your spouse or, or romantic partner for five minutes and determine whether you are going to stay married or get divorced. Um, and he said, wow, incredible use of you know, the thin slicing intuitive brain. Well, the only problem was that it wasn't thin slicing at all. It was 20 years of um, coding of behavioral interactions, coding of speech, running regression equations to try to figure out what predicted 
the staying together or not. Anyway, Dr. Gottman has done some great work on what keeps you married. Uh, my clue for tonight is avoid contempt. Apparently that's a bad thing for marriages. You don't want to express contempt. It's a minus four in the regression equation. Um, but um, the, I think the really impressive thing about Dr. Gottman, and he actually did this with his wife as well, is they said, okay, publishing scientific papers is not going to change the world of marriage and um, male-female relationships. So um, he and his wife formed this thing called the Gottman Institute. There's a nonprofit uh, part which does research, a profit-making part which uh, writes, where they write books, they produce videos, they train therapists, they have workshops, all to try to take this data and apply it to the lives of real people. And it's pretty clear that they spend at least as much time in how do you communicate effectively about these results as they do about coming up with them in the first place. So, uh, you know, let's face it, analytical people are not generally the best marketers of their own work. They kind of want to do the analysis and move on to more analysis, but we have to change that if we're going to have analytics guide decision making. We have to think as much about how you communicate the results as how you create them in the first place. So with that, I'll shut up and happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So I'm going to grab Tom for a couple of questions and I'm going to open it up for questions. I want to go back on something that you said though. You're talking about people struggling with um, social media uh, and, and obviously we're here to talk about integrated media this week. Uh, is the problem that people don't have metrics for social media or is the problem that no people don't know what they want out of social media or? Um, well, I, you know, the metrics are relatively primitive, I would say. I mean, the, the, um, the most common metrics for social media are um, uh, sort of top 10 complaints of uh, customers. Uh, what are the things that customers are, are um, saying it didn't go so well for them and that you categorize those and, and say, you know, this week, what are the top 10 things that people complain about? So counting complaints, that's not a terribly sophisticated metric. And positive or negative sentiment, which is also not terribly sophisticated. On the other hand, it's not easy to get to those things in any automated way. And uh, if you get a lot of social media about your brand or your company, it's not easy uh, in a non-automated fashion either. So um, the metrics are primitive, but they're sort of the, the best we can do. So you talked about the, the kinds of things that people are doing with marketing. So is there a sort of a hierarchy? People start um, with pricing and then they kind of move up. Uh, and do you find that people are pretty great now about using analytics for things like advertising placement? Well, I don't know that there is a, I mean, within um, B2B firms, I think, uh, B2B firms, I don't know if there are any here, they're always challenged from a marketing analytics standpoint because they don't have a lot of customers typically and they think, well, all these customer analytics are gonna to be tough for us. The one thing that works very well, no matter what industry you're in, unless you're a nonprofit or something, is pricing. And I always say, if you wanna make money with analytics, do pricing first. Um, uh, because almost anybody can make more money by doing pricing optimization of one type or another. So. It, it probably should be first for just about every every company. Now, if you are doing any sort of web stuff, you of course have to do some type of web analytics. Again, the metrics are relatively primitive. Uh, how many people came today? How long did they spend? Uh, how many times did they click on the right buttons? Uh, so, relatively primitive. The whole area of testing, A-B testing, multivariate testing is more sophisticated and the good companies really really do that. And then um, you get into, um, if you're doing any sort of uh, digital advertising, you get into the very big data world of, well, okay, how do I decide what ad to put in what context? And um, I mean, this is, you. if you're a chief marketing officer, you can get well over your depth in terms of analytical expertise very quickly. I mean, this is a situation where you're going to, these ads decisions, ad placement decisions are made in milliseconds, um, 
where the, you know, the number of cookies that you're analyzing and so on may well be in the you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and the number of models that you're gonna create to predict what ad goes best in, in what uh, publishing opportunity, there may well be, uh, I, I was talking to a woman who does this at a company here in New York, and she said, um, uh, we, we needed to use machine learning to uh, support our uh, predictive models for what ads go where. And I said, why machine learning? And frankly, I'm always a little suspicious of machine learning because you know, there's no human with a hypothesis involved and hence no decision makers being persuaded by you know, that whole thing about how do we market analytics. Machine learning, not that good at marketing, I've found. Um, but uh, she said, well, we need about 5,000 models a week. Uh, and I thought, man, that's interesting. M millisecond decision making, 5,000 models a week. This is not the reflective hypothesis driven process that you know, humans have often engaged in. So um, you have to get into that sort of thing. So if you're a CMO and you don't understand that, can be a very complex world to try to negotiate. There, uh, you know, there are exchange, buy side exchanges, sell side exchanges, uh, platforms of various types, it's a really complex world there. Probably a hundred vendors that you should be following if you're in that domain. Wow, one last question from me. You um, talked about the need to sort of tell the story of, of marketing, you did market analytics. You didn't talk about visual analytics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, so visual analytics have gotten quite popular um, of late. SAS has a new offering in that uh, domain, uh, um, apparently quite, quite popular. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Sa another division of SAS, the Jump Division, has had visual analytics for a long time. For some reason in big data, people seem to have discovered visual analytics all of a sudden. And um, I don't know why that is. Um, Sometimes, you know, visual analytics are really good at communicating relatively simple um, analyses to uh, managers who may not understand detailed analytical stuff. Um, so in a way, you know, we have this very complex data and the phenomenon that I discovered, I was doing some work for another article in Harvard Business Review called data scientists, the sexiest job of the 21st century. What my co-author in that space said, I, I ran into him at Procter & Gamble and I said, DJ, you know, these people are not using complex statistical models. And he said, yes, you've discovered the uh, big data equals small math phenomenon. Um, <laughs> and I often wonder if it takes, it takes so much work to get the data in shape for analysis in a big data world that there's not a whole lot of energy or time left over for complex analytics. I'm not sure, but so visual analytics have gotten much more popular. They are a good way to sort of tell a story with data. It's, but I think it's important to remember it's not the only way. We also have narrative approaches that have worked for pretty well for thousands of, of years also. Well, it sounds like you're also kind of suggesting that um, visual analytics could be kind of a shortcut that ignores a lot of other good, rich material. Well, there, it, you know, if, Human beings are not that good at seeing, you know, four-dimensional models. I don't, can any of you see well in four dimensions? I'm not that good at that. Um, and so if you have uh, a very complex regression model with uh, a lot of uh, um, independent variables, you're not going to be able to visualize that well. So simple counting, visual analytics are great, um, but when you get into complex statistics, uh, you may want to rely more on narrative, although you know that can be challenging as well. Or if you just want to tell the story to your CEO. Yeah, exactly. Not to say they're simple. So with that, let me open it up to the audience here and for questions. We have handheld mics. We'd ask you to raise your hand, and um, so we can get, we can actually record you asking questions. And don't be shy. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, so there's a recent Onion article that came out. Uh, <laughs> The well-known analytical journalism site. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I think it came out on Monday that said, "I um, front page news: the government finds out that you can use uh, the tools that marketing uses to gather information <laughs> about uh, citizens." So it's a really controversial topic about uh, our America's Constitution. But I was wondering, 
what your views were on the uh, gathering of information and whether or not of, on individuals and whether or not you think that there will be pressure based on the current political environment with regards to this issue towards gathering information in the future? Yeah, you know, it's a very good question and thanks for asking the, the first one. Um, I, I, I should look at that Onion article. It seems um, less fantastical than most Onion articles are. It seems quite uh, accurate, actually. Um, so, yeah, um, I, was, I was talking about this with some people at 60 Minutes today in New York who are thinking about um, doing a story on big data and, uh, you know, how it relates to both government and the, and the private sector. And, you know, I don't think anybody in the private sector who does much with marketing um, data would be too surprised at anything happening at the NSA. Yeah, I always comforted myself about, and I've done a little bit of work with the NSA in the past, I always comforted myself with, yeah, they collect a lot of data. Um, most of it is on uh, conversations uh, to and from the United States, not within the United States. Apparently that's changed a little bit uh, recently. That to me was a, a little bit of news. Um, but I always comforted myself that although the computers were pretty good at you know, analyzing the frequency of talking about bombs or terrorist events or whatever, that the humans who got that data were highly non-analytical at the places like the NSA. There have been some studies that most intelligence analysts seem to believe more in intuition and experience than they do in analytics, which is kind of strange. You know, we're spending tons and tons of our taxpayer dollars analyzing all these conversations and then it goes to highly non-analytical intelligence analysts and then it goes to even less analytical decision makers, you know, particularly when, um, uh, you know, the Obama administration's a bit more analytical than the Bush administration was, but um, still, you know, most of these people are not highly trained in, in analytical decision making. But now, I think, um, the, the CIA, the NSA have started to work with organizations like Palantir, Recorded Future, and so on, these companies that do a lot of big data analysis. I think you don't need those human analysts as much as you do anymore. So, you know, I think the NSA and the CIA and so on are actually well ahead of private sector companies in analyzing all this external data, um, but they are not necessarily ahead of the private sector in terms of you know, what, it, what the private sector does with customer data. I think the private sector needs to move toward more reliance on external data, not just the stuff in their own you know, internal transaction databases. And what does the public sector need to do? I don't know. I, I would be surprised if anything changed dramatically. I tend to subscribe to the, uh, remember the Scott McNeely comment, the guy who was CI, CEO of Sun Microsystems a few years ago? Somebody raised a perfectly good question about customer um, data privacy in a, in a conference, and he said, you don't have any privacy, get over it. So uh, it, it seems to me it would take a total unraveling of our entire both private and public sector uh, approaches to customer data uh, or citizen data to really change this much, and I just don't, don't see it happening. But, you know, it's been a very interesting week or so. The guy, someone else, please raise your hand. I just want to follow up on that. But do you think that because this has become such front, front page new, news that um, some cause people will sort of start thinking again about their data and where it is, and there might be some backlash for companies? Or do you think that customers are like, I'm thrilled to have a customized offer come up to me, and I'm happy that you know my credit card number, so when I make an order? Well, you know, the um, we were talking about this uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, there have been a couple of surveys of Americans about this, and if you ask Americans in general, do you think that um, data about you should be used for targeted offers, even for targeted ads? Um, they generally say no. Even people, young people say no, a majority of them. Yet our behaviors would certainly suggest otherwise, and there have been academic studies suggesting that you know, people will give away a huge amount of information about themselves in exchange for you know, a $2 discount. Uh, um, so um, 
I think that the, the behaviors are probably what we should go with rather than the expressed intentions in the, in the, in the polls. Someone else? How does, uh, it seems like big data and market analytics, you know, I think you allude to at least in the introduction, which I read in your book, it's nothing new. I mean, companies have been doing it for a long time. The government's doing it for even longer, likely. How do small companies, startup companies, they know they need it, how do they get access to it? Because right now it seems more like a big company thing. It's you need lots of really smart people, you need to be Google, you need to be the Walmart, whoever. How do small companies or startup companies even more? And how do you find those people as a startup? Yeah. How do you choose that person? Well, that, that's an interesting, interesting question. And I would actually argue that certain types of small startup companies were the leaders in big data. Um, uh, what was that company name? Starts with a G. Oh yeah, Google. No. <laughs> uh, it was a small startup company not that long ago, and LinkedIn and uh, eBay and so on, and they were the original big data companies. You know, they sort of built themselves around big data, and obviously they didn't stay small for for very long. Um, so if you're talking about online startups, I think those companies know what to do. And a lot of the big data um, startups are, are, you know, startups are by definition small companies. Um, but if you're an offline company, I think it's a whole different, um, uh, offline startup, it's a whole different kettle of fish. And um, the good news is that things are getting a huge amount easier in that regard. And you can go to Amazon EC2 and get your, you know, your cloud, um, computing services, you can hire some people from India to help you with the analytics if you want. Um, more and more data can be bought externally. Um, I think what's lacking for most um, entrepreneurs is, um, you know, any sense of what's possible in this regard and, and um, maybe even a desire. I teach at Babson College, number one school for entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of those students are not that interested in making decisions on the basis of analytics. They think, you know, they've got the golden gut. And you know, um, I, I think they're probably going to um, find out it's not quite as golden as they think, but that's sort of the way entrepreneurs have been for, for a long time, uh, outside of the online space where it's absolutely essential if you're going to have any success at all. So uh, I think it's, you know, it's the imagination and the, and the knowledge and the interests of, of the entrepreneurs that is the biggest constraint, um, not, the, not the tools themselves. What innovation is happening with sentiment analysis to make it more sophisticated and accurate? What needs to happen to make sentiment analysis more sophisticated and accurate? Is that yeah. uh, a good paraphrase anyway? Um, well, you know, it's, I don't really know. It's a, a very good question. Um, I'm sure there are people who probably know the answer. Um, uh, the, as I suggested, even for humans to um, classify language is really hard. I mean, it's like, you know, the best humans get it at a 70 or 80 percent level. Um, computers tend to do it less well. There, I mean, there's some things that um, computers do pretty well. I was, uh, uh, I do a fair amount of work in healthcare analytics and it turns out computers are pretty good at, as, uh, as good as humans at um, categorizing and classifying things in physicians and nurses notes. Um, so, you know, what disease you have, what treatment protocols the doctor or the nurse was recommending and, and so on. Which is a good thing because apparently half of electronic medical records is, you know, physicians notes. Um, but sentiment, uh, you know, I, it's, it's a tough thing. Do, do I like something or do I not like something? Even when I'm talking with my wife over dinner, we, we sometimes have uh, um, some misunderstandings about whether I like something or not, or, or she likes something or not. So it's a tough thing. And um, as, I, as I was saying, sarcasm, I was talking to a professor at USC recently who does sentiment analysis for political campaigns. He said sarcasm is a total nightmare for political sentiment uh, because people use it all the time in discussing politics and computers just can't tell sarcasm. So I don't know, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe that's the, 
the last thing that humans are really going to be good at is detecting sarcasm and, you know, irony. doing sentiment well, better. irony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, irony. Well, we may not be good for much, but we're still better at irony than the computers are. <laughs> question about your experience at the bank. Uh, it seems to me that um, as each division within the bank, each organizational piece does their own big data things, what they'll do is they'll squeeze and they'll optimize. So I think in many ways your experience was driven by bad optimization. Um, your branch couldn't help you. Uh, they passed it to somebody else who couldn't help you because they've all squeezed that. So just, that's just sort of an observation. And, and the question really is, um, how do you manage that organizationally? Because uh, I think the brief history of marketing um, online has actually been the more data we get, the stupider we get. We've actually managed to sort of um, optimize our way to lower and lower click-through rates and lower and lower satisfaction. One last thing on that, just to sort of, um, sort of round out the comment, is um, Dell is widely regarded as the poster child for social media. Uh, Dell's results are frankly terrible. Apple is focused on products, by contrast, does nothing in social, and as far as I know, does nothing about sentiment analysis. So how do you balance all that stuff? You know, has data really helped us? Um, yeah, oh, details, details. <laughs> the, you know, the fact that these organizations are doing terribly should not enter into your, your thinking. No. Um, uh, good, so several good points. I, you know, I, I think you, you correctly point out that in many cases the problem is organizational. And turns out, for my own bank, I have done a fair amount of consulting and I'm pretty aware of um, some of the problems. So they decided, I think quite rightly, that if you're going to do um, omni-channel um, customer relationships and omni-channel data, that it didn't really make sense to have kind of silos of channel organizational responsibility. So in the past, you know, the online people were different from the branch people, and they were different from the from the call center people, and and um, so on. So I thought, brilliant move. They put all channel responsibility under one person, who I really liked, and she was a Boston Red Sox fan too, which I think is really admirable. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 well, this worked for I don't know three or four months, and then they somehow decided that the digital and, and mobile channels needed to come out and be part of another executive's responsibility. So they totally backed away from that. So, you know, a lot of power and politics go into these decisions. If we're doing it for reasons of customer relationships and information, there's no doubt about the fact that it ought to be, you know, one organization responsible for all channels to the customer. The other problem at my bank, um, and many banks in the U.S. is that they have acquired a lot of banks over the last decade or so, and um, I mean, the more I say about my bank, the more it's going to be easy to <laughs> figure out who it is. I can't but, wait to see it. <laughs> um, they, um, it, it. Acquisitions really screw up the whole area of, of you know data management and analytics because you know we just can't seem to put it together. For years, my bank would ask me what language I spoke uh, when I stuck my card into an ATM. Uh, you know, you would think they could figure that out uh, pretty readily. Um, so uh, there, there is that issue. On Dell, you know, I, it's very interesting to me. I was down at Dell last um, week, and they, I think they really are quite good at social media analytics. Um, but this is true about analytics in general. Um, if you ain't got some interesting products to sell, analytics aren't going to make a whole lot of difference. So um, I, uh, I didn't want to mention Dell in the, in the article, but in the blog post, I wrote a blog post before I went down there saying, you know, analytics are great on the margin. They give you a, a small edge over somebody with the same capabilities. But if you don't have products and services that people want to buy, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. And, you know, Dell got stuck with a product, P commodity PCs that nobody's that interested in anymore. They didn't have a tablet. Um, uh, they were not nearly as stylish or as cool as Apple. Um, so they, they need to change that. I don't think social media analytics are going to do the job.
Can you hear me? No. I am the uh, director of marketing analytics for the cab brand in New York. Um, um, so you said a little bit. They, I don't know. There's some kind of bad acoustics up here. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can hear you just a little louder. I think. Okay. Um, I run marketing analytics for the Gap brand. Oh, for the Gap. Really, yes, that's right. Yes, I've heard of that. So. Um, <laughs> for uh, the specialty business. In New okay. York. Um, what I'm finding is that there's a um, tremendous amount of ROI analysis that's been done for spend that has to do with media, yeah. advertising, traditional, possibly even emerging media. But a significant amount of spend in retail happens outside of these channels like in-store experience or... Or, or windows or signage. Can you point to some research or any type of innovation that's happening that we can learn from where uh, you know, the ROI of, of those channels can become more obvious? Yeah, no, um, you're right that um, it tends to be we, uh, what was that old um, uh, joke about some drunk guy is looking around on the ground and somebody comes along and says, uh, uh, you know, what are you looking for? Oh, you know, my keys. And, oh, did you lose them here? No, but the light's much better here because there's a street light here. So uh, uh, we tend to measure the ROI of things that are easier to measure. So, and it's great that in, in marketing, we now can measure a huge variety of stuff um, and can determine, you know, what's working and what isn't. And that, that old um, John Wanamaker line uh, about, uh, I know I'm wasting 50%, I just don't know which, which half. Not really true anymore for the most part, but there are still some domains where either by custom or by difficulty of measurement, uh, we, we still don't know. So, you know, store windows would be a, a great example. I think it would be sad if we got rid of store windows, because <laughs> uh, what are we going to look at as we walk down the street if we don't have them? But um, we don't have a whole lot of evidence. Now, I think, frankly, that's going to change, and I think video analytics are going to be the key to that, and we'll be able to you know, recognize who's looking at our store windows and how long they spend there, and we'll be able to, you know, my guess is we'll find they don't really make that much of a of a difference, but um, anyway, in any case, we'll know, and I think that that will sort of restore the balance a bit between uh, uh, online sales and brick and mortar sales, because we'll be able to tell how long did they look, what did, what specifically did they look at, did they look at more than one thing and compare, um, and we'll be able to tell who was it doing that. It'll, you know, we'll have some issues with the creepiness factor of video analytics recognizing us, but my friends in video analytics tell me, you know, can be done, most of that stuff can be done now. Wow. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, can you give your perception on the most common mistakes that organizations may use in analyzing big data or the data that would uh, be most pertinent to them? So, because um, we, we know that there's a lot of push around massaging the data, obtaining the data, but where, where do you see the negatives? Um, well, you know, I think the, um, I think the biggest mistake among large organizations is in ignoring uh, big data, particularly ignoring external sources of big data. A lot of companies are really very focused on, on their, you know, still dealing with their internal data. Um, I mentioned Brian Moynihan from Bank of America earlier, and um, he uh, apparently recently saw some stuff about unstructured data, sent a message to the guy in charge of analytics saying, what are we doing about this? You know, in the way that CEOs often do, you probably attach the article. Uh, um, and the guy, head of analytics said, well, nothing, because we've got our hands full with structured data. And I think that's a dangerous thing to do. I mean, I respect the guy who's in charge of analytics there, and um, in, in general, I think he's a smart guy. But uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities, and, and we ought to be uh, looking more at them in large companies. In small companies, I think, even in small online companies, I think the biggest mistake is kind of gathering a lot of data without being sure what we're going to do with it. Um, um, so I've worked with a, a couple of um, 
big data companies in Boston. One uses internet data um, and uh, makes it available for analysis. Uh, the other uses physician data. It's a healthcare big data startup. And um, neither of them were quite sure what anybody was going to do with this stuff. So the, the, the sense is data is kind of valuable on its own right, and eventually we'll figure it out. And I, you know, I think that's a risky, risky sort of approach to take. And you don't find that nearly as much in big companies. I just finished with SaaS. In fact, you can download it from the SaaS um, website if you are so inclined. Uh, report on big data in big companies. And the big companies I talked to, I talked to 20 um, with Jill Bechet of SAS. Th those companies are, you know, they're quite clear on what they're doing with it and they are not gathering it, you know, for the sake of, of you know, maybe we'll figure out someday what to do with this stuff. It's, there's some clear business purposes. And frankly, they don't seem that excited about even the term big data or data scientists or any of this stuff. They said, eh, we've been doing that for for years, it's not anything revolutionary for us. Time for one last question. Hi, I know very recently that um, Facebook is trying to make the argument that uh, their ads don't lead to clicks, but that they lead to offline behavior. Um, do you believe, uh, do you buy that argument, first of all, or do you think that they're just trying to change the, uh, the question so that uh, they could justify their low click-through rates? Well, I know, I, I mean, I think they lead to both, actually. I think they lead to both clicks and, and online, uh, offline behavior. And the good news is that they, I mean, they know, it's quite easy to know that they lead to clicks. And I've seen some advertisements, for example, in the travel industry where they say, you know, some of the targeted ads that they have done have um, led to sort of eightfold returns and uh, marketing spend. Um, um, so they, they do lead to clicks. And because of this company they work with, is a Boston area company, I know the CEO, um, Data Logics, they actually know that it leads to offline behavior as well. So, you know, it's kind of scary, but Data Logics works with, um, you know, grocery uh, firms and uh, apparel firms and so on that have loyalty programs, and they can actually track. Did that Facebook ad, uh, first of all, did the person see it? Did they click on it? And did it lead them to buy something in that store? Um, and apparently, you know, they're, they're pretty effective for the most part. So um, uh, it, I think it's illustrative of the fact that we can now tie online and offline behavior better than we ever have been able to before. And uh, that, you know, it seems to be effective in, in both regards. I'm sure there are some areas where it's not that effective, but in something like travel, which is a um, generally a pretty social experience for a lot of people. You're, if you see your friends are going someplace, you might be more interested in going there too. Certainly that's true for entertainment. I was talking to Ticketmaster, said Facebook linked advertising is huge for them. You know, if your friends are going to a concert, you're probably quite interested in that as well. On the other hand, CBS told us, I don't, I don't know if they said this at the, at the gathering we did, Angela, but they said, eh, you know, people don't seem to be inclined to talk about deals on toilet paper over Facebook, so um, it's not that social of a, of, a, of a category. So I think it depends on the industry, but in some areas it, it's extremely effective. Yeah. Fascinating discussion. I think we heard that from Sephora, that they had begun to really do that, a lot of integration between looking at the website versus the, the bricks and mortar. Yeah, that, that is a little more social, yeah. I think, talking about cosmetics. It's more exciting yeah. to talk about nail polish than <laughs> toilet paper. But it's been a very exciting discussion. However, we are out of, ta uh, out of time. And I we're out of town, too, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank all of you for being with us, and I want to thank SAS for, again, making this event possible. Um, this concludes our discussion, but we'd like to invite you to stay with us and talk about all that we've uh, been discussing um, over cocktails. Thanks so much for being with us.